And my name is Yuan Xiang, Yuan Xiang is a professor of anthropology and the Center for Chinese Studies. It is really my great honor to be here introducing the speaker and the model that is here in the Q&A session. So before that, let me um, start by saying this exciting event, today is only the session one of this exciting event brought here by um, Professor Sonny Bonner. Is mainly hosted by the Center for Jewish Studies, but also co-sponsored uh, co -sponsor by a number of units on campus that include uh, Department of History, Computer Institute, Department of Asian Language and the Cultures, East Asian Library, and also the Center for Chinese Studies. So uh, that fact alone reflects a wide range of interest in this very exciting area of study. And also from my own rather selfish point of view, I see a bright future of a, a new frontier, that is a comparative study of Jewish and Chinese cultures. So, and today we are very, very fortunate to have a Professor uh, Li Hong Sung from uh, the Department of History, uh, Department of Religious Studies at Nanjing University. And he is currently the faculty director of the Diane and the Guilford Glazer Institute for Jewish Studies at the Nigerian University and also a social professor of religious, of religious studies. And he received his PhD in 2003 from Nigerian University and also completed <coughs> a postdoctoral program at the University of Tel Aviv from 2003 and 2004. And um, he gained um, fame, as I put that way, and a, a wide um, recognition by his study on the Jewish identity in the human world. I'm not sure whether he's going to talk about that today, but that's uh, his, uh, among other studies he has, he has done, his best known so far. And, um, well, I guess without further ado, uh, let's have uh, Professor Li Hong Sun. Thanks for Professor Yen. It's really my uh, great honor to be here. Uh, and I'm also grateful to a Center for Today Studies and a Center for Chinese Studies and all those institution, institutions uh, that brought me to here and to share with you some of my thoughts on Judaic studies in China. You know, at my university, uh, I teach an undergraduate course entitled Judaism uh, and World Civilizations, which attracted 400 undergraduate students uh, each year. You know, at the beginning of my course, I usually you know, ask them to name whatever pops up in their mind uh, in association with Jews or Judaism. You know, almost without fail, you know, the rich and smart, you know, persecuted in history, yet persistent until now. The Star of David, you know, absent, absent, abstention from pork, Marx, Freud, and Einstein, you know, will frequent the listing. However, the Bible uh, is seldom mentioned, or at least marginalized in most Chinese students' uh, perception on Jews, which seems to me very telling. You know, after all, the regnant faces in China throughout most of its history are Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. Most Chinese, uh, past and present, had no acquaintance with the Bible and with the common uh, religious traditions of Judaism and the other two monotheistic faces. Now, this situation is in stark contrast with that in the Middle East, Europe, North Africa, and African uh, American continents, where Jewish history is long bound up, and where the Jewish people has been in intimate uh, interaction with Christians and uh, Islamic cultures. You know, despite its, this historic lack of exposure to monotheism and the Bible, there is a widespread interest in Jews in today's China, on both popular and academic levels. You know, as a clue to the former, the shelves of Chinese bookstores 
aligned with best sellers you know, of Jewish subjects, with such eye-catching you know, titles as Talmud, <coughs> the greatest Jewish Bible for making money, you know, unveiling the secrets of Jewish success in world economy, and you know, what's behind Jewish excellence, you know, the financial empire of the Rothschilds, you know, the Talmudic wisdom in running business, other books of his kind. <laughs> you know, for Jewish sensibilities, the Chinese curiosity for the secret to Jewish power and success like these is ominous. In the smacking of spread of conspiracy theory and self and anti-Semitism that have brought so much suffering and trauma to the Jewish people. Yet to my mind, it's not uh, it's no it not so much betrays the kind of uh, Judeophobia, because the religious implications of anti-Semitism in Europe and in Arab lands was and is irrelevant in China. Rather, it reveals some sort of Judeophilia, revealing the eagerness and anxiety with which a nation that is focused on economic growth and technological advancement casts about for an imitable model it can employ to modernize itself. The Jewish secret to success is such a model, albeit an imagined one. On a different level, Jewish studies you know, have been broadly established in universities where they were scarcely existed at all uh, before China normalized its diplomatic relations with the State of Israel in 1992, that's 20 years ago. Today, no less than 10 institutions of higher learning are able to grant degrees in Jewish history and culture, Hebrew language and literature, Middle Eastern studies, uh, Jewish philosophy and religion. The past 20 years also witnessed the creation of several uh, academic centers specialized in Jewish and Israeli studies. What's more, articles addressing Jewish topics are increasingly well represented in learned journals in China. You know, considering the weakening of the humanities and social sciences in favor of you know, natural sciences and economics in general, and the non-proselytizing nature of Judaism, and there are enhanced the invisibility of China's Jewish communities in particular, this development is really fast and phenomenal. So it is well worth asking, then, in a land which is neither Christian nor a Muslim, and while Judaism never took root, what are the perceptible you know, orientations of the Jewish studies there? You now, what kind of issues uh, may Chinese scholars encounter when teaching and writing about Jews and Judaism? Does the unique context in which the Jewish studies are emerging have its bearing upon Chinese practitioners? Or in what way may Chinese Jewish studies appear different from those produced in other quarters of the world? You know, these are the questions that I intend to reflect upon in a comparative you know, perspective. I will try to address these three questions in two talks. You know, today, I will deal with some of the general issues surrounding the assumption and the academic structure and the related pedagogical issues in China. So tomorrow, I will focus upon exclusively on another case study, that is, the Jewish community in Kaifeng, simply because you know, this topic has attracted the most sustained scholarly effort of the Chinese scholars. You know, the idea of Jew Judaism and Hellenism as two major origins of Western civilizations is so prevailing among Chinese you know, contemporary intelligentsia that any further warrant for incorporating Jew Jewish studies, uh, incorporating Jewish studies courses into the university curriculum sounds superfluous. Beyond doubt, the knowledge of Judaism is indispensable for our understanding of the exceptional contribution to world civilization. You know, as a leading scholar articulated in a study on Jewish culture uh, that is extensively used as a textbook in China, you know, Jewish culture is one of the most uh, ancient human civilizations, a culture that has exerted a tremendous and profound impact 
upon the progress of world civilization and especially of Western civilization. The study of Jewish culture affords the Chinese people of the 20th century a salutary lesson. How to play a greater role in the international affairs can be seen as both an important goal the Chinese people cherish in their moving towards the world and the challenge they face. To understand Jewish culture is a requisite step towards meeting both ends because Jewish thoughts have influenced the constituents and the cause of the world civilization and because the traces of Jewish culture is ubiquitous and distinctively visible in Western culture. So quite obviously, to study Jewish culture is essential for our conceptualization and reconfiguration of the world, primarily the West, in relation to China's t the steady integration into international society. You know, this assumption the lurking in the Chinese popular imagination of Jews as well is decidedly a far cry from that in the modern West, while the purpose of the Jewish contribution to civilization is usually thought of as referring to a certain variety of Jewish apologetic enjoinder to modern anti-Semitism, denial of the full acceptance of Jews into European and American societies. It's a recurrent discourse in modern Jewish history. It significantly penetrated the sense of self of many Jewish scholars, driving them, consciously or subconsciously, to prove the worthiness of Jews according to the criteria of a non-Jewish worldview, sometimes to a poignant you know, ex ex extent of subverting the dominantly Christian master narrative of Western civilization by claiming to a kind of Jewish superiority. You know, for example, Abraham Geiger, a pioneer of Jewish studies in the 19th century, wrote extensively on the historical background of Jesus in early Judaism, as Susanna Herschel you know, convincingly argued. His main point was that Jesus was not only a Jewish religious leader, but specifically a Pharisee, you know, whose goal was nothing more than of the Pharisees. That is, the democratization of Judaism. Nothing in Jesus' teaching was new and original. The Geiger's viewpoint not only sought to, uh, to, uh, to counter the widespread image of Judaism as a degenerate religion, which was current in the Christian scholarship of his own day, but went further, insisting that Judaism was the original, true religion from which Christianity and Islam were deviant derivatives. So in light of this view, the Jewish contribution to civilization, notwithstanding a mode of thought that has motivated Chinese scholars, is devoid of this apologetic import in China. So in short, far from marginalized, Jews in Chinese eyes stand at the very center of Western civilization. So accompanied with this lack of apologetic assumption is the want of Jewish identity. Modern scientific study of Jews and Judaism from its beginnings in the so-called Wissenschaft des Judentums, the scientific study of Jews, down to the present, is by and large a Jewishly bound and fraught with, as Michael Mayer, you know, masterly coach, two persistent tensions. The first is that between religious and secular approach, and the second is that between efforts directed inward to serve the spiritual and cultural needs of the Jewish community and outward to serve scholarly purposes for their own sake. You know, what looms largest behind these tensions and dilemmas is the intertwined nexus between critical Jewish learning and Jewish faith. In contrast, Chinese Jewish studies, produced at least predominantly by and for the Chinese, could be described as the Jewish studies independent of Jewish faith and without intent to cultivation and strengthening of Jewish identity. Hence, it is unburdened of the fate to search its role both in the academy and in the tradition of Jewish learning. So it was pointing out in this regard that Though the attention of Chinese scholars has been drawn to a wide spectrum of Jewish topics, 
you know, ranging from Moses to Ben Gurion, from Dead Sea Scrolls to Holocaust, from Philo to Nebulas, from Isaac Singer to Amos Oz. You know, no single piece of article, as far as I can tell, you know, deals solidly with Jewish liturgy. You know, even pieces of a general description are truly few and far between. You know, in the United States, you know, I studied one year in a rabbinical college, you know, and I said many services in the synagogue. Now I understand that liturgy is the living issue for the Jews. The Jewish prayer book has been read and reread in many generations in every Jewish community. The change as reflected in liturgy has been seen as a miniature version of change facing Judaism in general. So in this sense, the absence of Jewish liturgy on the research agenda of Chinese Jewish studies may well be construed uh, to mean that the Jewish experience is not comprehended in China as an entity in the totality of its spatial and temporal phenomenon. And the Jews and Judaism are studied not as a living organism, but I would venture to suggest a living fossil. <laughs> so this seems to be an unavoidable you know, consequence of the Jewish studies, not boasted by Jewish identity, and perhaps no less important, inaccessible to the, to the lived Jewish experience. So my awareness of this point also touched off a new question. So in what terms should I, as an observer outside the Jewish tradition, approach Judaism and Jewish civilization? Some elements of Judaism, such as prayer, are fundamental components of Jewish tradition, but structurally and culturally alien to the way we live now in China. So how is it possible to present these elements in my own teaching and research so as to induce enough wideness of their intrinsic value to Judaism and still avoid uh, inciting suspicion that I'm trying to ferment faith commitments in class teaching. So honestly, I don't have an answer. No, this is a challenge for me. Now, above are some, uh, are some of the, the basic assumptions for teaching Jewish studies in China. Now I turn to the academic structure and pedagogical issues. You know, in a highly sensitive and suggestive strategy paper of 2004, you know, calling for greater Jewish engagement uh, with China, Solomon Wild, you know, a, a scholar from a think tank in Jerusalem, you know, he uh, noted a phenomenon symptomatic of the uh, current Chinese Jewish scholarship, you know, to quote, Reviewing the Chinese authors of Jewish and Israeli studies between uh, 1980 and today, one finds a number of names of the 1980s and early 1990s that have since disappeared. Except for a few, there is not yet a strong and stable Jewish scholarship community with a long-term commitment. You know, this diagnosis, acting lead, sounds like a distant echo of a remark of Isma Organ, you know, in 1927, uh, that great Jewish historian of Wissenschaft, the student Tumus, branded the work of non-Jewish scholars of his time as unnecessarily inadequate because they lacked enthusiasm for their subject and also what he called an indispensable inner feeling for the spirit of the Hebrew language. You know, the difference, though, is that while I certainly smelled no anti-Semitic odor here. You know, he speculated the first reason for this might be the lack of long-term academic employment of Chinese specialists in this area. Secondly, the effect of the Intifada would, choose, would, would make choosing Jews and Israel as research themes appear in consonant with China's pro-Palestinian political rhetoric and therefore no longer offer advantageous promise for a career. I think the second explanation is basically tenable and especially holds true for scholars whose research is closely connected with contemporary Middle Eastern politics and may touch upon the Muslim sensibilities. The, this could be observed in 1993, the year that witnessed the publication of an abridged edition of Chinese, uh, abridged Chinese edition of Encyclopedia Judaica, 
to this day the most influential reference book on Jews and Judaism. Uh, in his foreword to the Chinese edition, Professor Li Senzhi, a very famous and a scholar, you know, wrote that Judaism was the mother religion of Christianity and Islam. When the first printing was sold out, you know, a second revised edition was planned. You know, the ambassador of Saudi Arabia raised an official protest, followed by more effective protests from domestic Islamic associations, to the effect that Islam was a new religion that has nothing to do with you know, Judaism. The initial official re, uh, reaction was to prohibit the second edition. The editor-in-chief, Professor Xu Xing, was called up to Beijing to render account. The authority finally allowed the second edition, but on the condition that the foreword by Li Senzhi be eliminated. So Wang's first explanation you know, relates to the disciplinary framework whose nuances may uh, need further amplification. The Jewish studies at the university level uh, in China are organized neither as an autonomous department, as they might be in Israel, nor as an interdepartmental program, as is often the case in North America. So my understanding is that Jewish studies in Israel seems to enjoy a disciplinary status in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, for example. There are independent departments of Bible, Talmud, his Jewish history, Jewish thought, all subsumed within the Institute of Jewish Studies. This is very unique to Israel, for it is impossible to find under the umbrella of School of Humanities in China independent departments of Confucianism, Taoism, Chinese Buddhism, Chinese history, or Chinese thought. Instead, only departments of history, philosophy, and religion exist. Now, by contrast, a Jewish studies program in America generally consists of one chair around which gathers a cadre of scholars from various disciplines. Now, both models are presumably instrumental in fostering uh, interdisciplinary study. Now, in China, as an ingrained practice, the manifold areas uh, or aspects of Jewish studies are each affiliated with quite disparate disciplines. In Chinese universities that teach Judaism uh, or Jewish studies of any kind, such courses are commonly located among five departments. History, Oriental Language, International Relations, uh, philosophy and all religious studies. So Jewish studies have thus developed in a fragmented way with the concomitant problem first expressed in the dearth of interdisciplinary studies. As is well known, few scholars who work in humanities today can be unaware of the degree to which disciplinary boundaries have been eroded and of the constant turmoil in disciplinary identity that has resulted. So this problem or challenge is not very peculiar in China, but also has universal implications. So a more noteworthy issue is how to find a common language among scholars under the level of Jewish studies. History and religion departments offer only shorter courses of basic Hebrew. The Department of Oriental Studies is accomplished in teaching modern Hebrew. Nevertheless, defining Judaism within the framework of the Orient or Near East in particular you know, limits the department to an important yet relatively small segment of Jewish history. So this leaves out the manifestations of Jewish experience in, in European and American diasporas which are crucial to the understanding of today's Judaism. So Jewish studies based within a department of philosophy usually find it very difficult to integrate courses of Jewish history and culture into the curriculum and thereby run the risk of reducing Judaism to a purely spiritual phenomenon or of disregarding the vital aspects of Jewish people as a living organism. 
So as for those adepts at international relations, they often carry the idea that the knowledge of background of Jewish history before modern era is unnecessary for analyzing current Jewish and Israeli political engagement on international scenes. So given the disciplinary training, it's primarily to those disciplines rather than to their Jewish dimensions that most Chinese scholars uh, may feel their major intellectual commitment. They see themselves first and foremost as historians, philosophers, philologists, or literary critics, then as Jewish studies scholars. <coughs> so in addition, all academic centers of Jewish studies at Chinese universities are small in size, usually comprising two to three members, while the range of Jewish study is extremely daunting. You know. That's another problem that arises of how to design curricula and syllabi for courses that conform to the ad hoc, the specialized field of few teachers, while at the same time taking the students' interests into a reasonable consideration. So some of the practical and pedagogical challenges, as, as mentioned above, are by no means unique for Chinese Jewish studies scholars but have significant parallels among you know, scholars in other countries. So this intensifies the need for cooperation, domestic and international. I think without a network of mutual support, the small centers might face the danger of withering isolation, without the formation of a scholarly community in which members with different disciplinary training can immerse themselves in a conscious and the you know, constant quest for the fusion of horizons with each other, the impression that Chinese scholars are no longer committed in Jewish and Israeli studies would be destined to linger. So we now have established some regular you know, joint programs in recent years. For example, there is annual summer workshop on Jewish history, uh, culture, and religion that are taught by both scholars from domestic universities and celebrated Jewish scholars from Israel and the United States. The audience is composed of graduate students majoring in Jewish studies across China. You know, since two years ago, under the generous sponsorship of Adelson Family Foundation, Yad Vashem and the London Jewish Culture Center have organized in Jerusalem three workshops for educators from China. You know, these workshops do not exclusively focus on the Holocaust, but also you know, unravel the major issues in Jewish history and important aspects of Israeli society. So here I want to emphasize that the consequences of the academic exchange with Israel can hardly be overemphasized. Uh, we better recall that the full and accelerated development of Chinese Jewish studies uh, had not been set in motion until 20 years ago, the year when uh, uh, the diplomatic relations between Israel and China was established. In effect, this is, it is after this year that countless popular books about Jews have been spawned and almost all academic centers were created. This fact arguably shows the towering impact of the existence of the State of Israel and its accessibility to the Chinese people. So thanks to the exchange programs launched by the government, Chinese students are able to go to Israeli universities each year, and their ongoing work on Jews and Judaism will surely bring formative change in the long run. So now it's time to address the last question. Can we see Chinese Jewish studies have its own characteristics? I want to give you two interpretations of Yavne, one Jewish and the other Chinese. So Yavne is the small coastal town south of today's Tel Aviv. According to Jewish tradition, during the Jewish revolt against the Romans in 70 CE, the Jewish leader, Yohanan ben Sakai, when he foresaw the destruction of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple, sought to take preventive measures to avert the catastrophe. He approached the Roman general and asked him, to ya asked him for Yavne. So give me Yavne. I only want the city. Well, shattered Judaism might be healed by the formation of a new culture 
that would replace the temple, the Roman general agreed, without any awareness that his decision would give this defeated people a chance to create a spiritual center that was destined to outlive the victorious Roman Empire. So in short, Yavne, the city, represents the very beginning of rabbinic Judaism. In 1940s, Gedali Alon, the dean of the Talmudic history in Israel, published a brilliant paper in which he questioned the historical authenticity of his, of his founding myth. He argued, Yavne was a Roman internment camp for war prisoners and fugitives, and Yohanan ben Sakai was sent there against his will. I'm aware of this you know, very unique interpretation. Professor Xu Xin, one of the founders of Jewish studies in China, also wrote a paper on Yavne a few years ago. For him, the Jewish military resistance as embodied at Masada was self-destructive, whereas what was going on in Yavne was truly a silent revolution which transformed the Jewish people, making Jewish identity no longer anchored on race, geography, or political systems, but on culture. More important of all, this revolution was led by Jewish intellectuals, so to speak. So, to quote, as intellectuals, rabbis are different from the biblical prophets who, despite their denunciation against all forms of injustice, do not believe in human progress and men's ability to make laws for history. The only demand they made for the Jewish people is to surrender to God for the final redemption. By contrast, Rabbis ask the people to open the book and to see in it the guidance of God. To open the book means to respect not only knowledge, knowledge per se, but also knowledgeable person as well. In the following 2,000 years, the history and fate of the Jewish people have been grasped in the hands of Jewish intellectuals. It is under the guidance of Jewish intellectuals that the Jewish people were able to survive the diaspora. So in short, according to Professor Xu Xin, Yavne marks the beginning of takeover of national leadership by Jewish intellectuals, which was unprecedented in world history. Now these two interpretations of Yavne seem to have nothing in common, but actually share an indispensable inner feeling for the subject. The Dalia alone lauded as the Jewish Monson, you know, the greatest Roman historian, emigrated from Berlin to Palestine in 1920s. When he wrote that article in 40s, Yavne seems to serve as a double trope. Uh, it was both a trope for the concentration camp, where numerous fellow Jews were slaughtered mercilessly. Meanwhile, it was also a trope for Palestine under the British mandate. However, uh, 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 though still poverty-stricken with the increasing arrival of war captives and fugitives, <coughs> however reluctantly from their own point of view, Yavne, you know, or the state of Israel, or Palestine, was becoming the national center, harboring the hope of national resuscitation. By contrast, Professor Xu Xin underwent the turmoil of the Cultural Revolution, whose dark shadow still lingers on the title of the paper. It's called Under Revolution in Yavne. So what loomed large from his interpretation are the innumerable Chinese intellectuals whose human dignity was trampled and whose lives were taken during the Cultural Revolution. So both interpretations are imbued with the author's concern with the national fate and the national history and both are truly original and poignant. So in sum, uh, striding over the upheavals of the past century, China is reopening to many foreign influences. Many Chinese turn their side in the West War in search of the secrets for wealth and power. So Jews and Judaism uh, were discovered and conceptualized 
as the integral and pivotal components of Western tradition. The knowledge about them is seen as instrumental in helping the Chinese understand themselves and their own position in the world, and as valuable for China's effort to understand and to steer its way in the international scene. Accordingly, uh, the investigation of Jewish tradition has been more or less absorbed into a Chinese perspective and directed to a Chinese agenda. In this context, at least for us, the Chinese scholars of Jewish studies in China, the encounter between what Benjamin Schwartz, the late distinguished Jewish sinologist at Harvard, called a totalizing civilization and a textually based religious tradition, and the consequent largely intuitive you know, construction of self by seeking out family resemblances and potential compatibilities with the other, we will retain their perennial fascination. So finally, although uh, Jewish studies practiced by uh, the Chinese is immune from the cluster of tensions and dilemmas that lies between faith and secularity, that, and that informs Jewish practitioners of Jewish studies, as noted by Michael Mayer. It's still not without its own Janus-like concern. That is, with popular fantasies about Jews and Judaism of that magnitude in mind, shall we face inward towards satisfying academic colleagues, or shall we face outward and endeavor to leaven an undistorted, meaningful, and accessible knowledge of, of the Jewish people to a broader Chinese audience? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Xiong, and especially for this uh, panoramic view of the Chinese scholarship on Jewish studies. And it is a very insightful analysis of the specific features of that Chinese scholarship. I think you now we are open to see the floor. I actually wonder, do I need to stand between you and the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can just pick up and let yourself. I've had the opportunity to, to travel somewhat in China and discuss the perception of Judaism with many Chinese people, not necessarily Chinese scholars, but just ordinary people. And, um, and my children, living here and going to school with lots of diversity, I feel like there's almost like this reflexive interrelationship between the modern view in China of the Jewish culture and the modern Jew in America of Chinese culture and Chinese American culture as holding sort of clues or keys to success both financial and intellectual, and sort of a, 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 an unspoken mutual admiration that I think Chinese families want, in, in, in both America and China, want their kids to be more Jewish. And Jewish families, in, and, and non-Jewish families in America want their kids to be more Asian or more Chinese. I sort of feel like there's this strange mutual admiration that goes on. Yeah, that's, that's a new, I never thought of that. <laughs> China, we also, like Jews, we you know, very much value you know, the learning. You know, Could you hear from the back? No. You have you know, a pushing Jewish mother, we have pushing Chinese mother too. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you know, that that's, may not be a, you know, a, a kind of influence, but it's culture tradition. We probably share the same cultural values. I, I'm, I'm curious to understand, uh, you know, what led you to begin your studies because I have met several Chinese persons <coughs> who did that and they said they started with American literature, the Jewish American authors led them to think there was more behind the books. They had to dig deeper and then they followed that. But you didn't mention literature, so I'm wondering. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, you know, many, as far as I know, many scholars in China in the dealing with Jewish studies 
developed as you know from American literature, especially Jewish literature. You know, Isaac Singh, the Saul Bellow, they are very fascinated by that. But I, I was trained as a Roman historian. I, I know, happen to know the works of Josephus. I, I was fascinated by the works of Josephus. So, <laughs> I was happy to pick up the question because I can remember whose hand up first in a second. There's this, uh, yes. And there's yeah, I, I want to ask you two questions. One is uh, the, 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 the troubling episode with, uh, with the Saudi ambassador uh, were there any further uh, uh, ramifications? Because th this is th this is problematic in the sense that, um, first of all, that one sees the po political political power intervening in in um, the Jewish studies, um, and it, it's the beginning of some antagonism. I mean, I, whether we term it anti-Semitism or not, that's uh, irrelevant. Um, but it's the way of introducing political conflict into, uh, into, academic, into the academic field as a factor that would limit the full assessment of the role of the interrelationship of Judaism and Islam, which it seems to me is necessary in, in, in an academic setting. Um, that, that's the first question. I'd like to hear your reflection on that and whether there were any responses or, or further uh, ramifications. And secondly, um, what happens when uh, the, Chin the Chinese will discover that Jews are no longer the great intellectuals that they imagine them to be, <laughs> and that and that and that there's a leveling, there's a leveling, a cultural leveling that occurs when you become too comfortable and too successful, so that the very striving and aspiration for success has in it uh, a, a negative pushback. Uh, and uh, so I, I, there's something troubling about that being the factor that is, the, is dominant in, 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 in the interest. Uh, first, the first question, you know, as to your first question, you know, you know, in China we have a sizable you know, Muslim communities, you know, which is basically a you know, fundamentalist in their you know, outlook. So, as I said, the consequence, there are you know, some forbidden areas. You, know, you don't touch that. It's not good for your you know, career or promotion. You know. If you, you know, write more about you know, interaction between you know, Judaism and Islam, probably <coughs> you get little chance to publish your research. That's, that's a reality we have to face. As, as I mentioned, the professor Xu Xing wrote a textbook on Jewish culture, in which it contains a chapter on the relationship between Islam and Judaism. And that book uh, waited, I think, was sent to uh, the, to Beijing to the censor Bureau of Censorship, and when it waited two years you know, to get the permission to publish. So, don't touch that. <laughs> you can. Uh, also, uh, the second question. You know, I don't think you know. In the short run, you know, people's perception about Judaism will not change. You know. I think there are always intellectual curiosity and genuine scholarship. You know. And basically, in university level, scholars are less influenced by those popular discourse. And also, I think that the, the foundation of that fantasy about Judy, Jewish intellectuals is solid. <laughs> in one <laughs> word, well, well, the well, no, I, if, I can, if I can come back to, there's an intellectual conceit that intellectuals can actually determine the nature of a society. It's a problem. And that that at that percent, it's much more complicated, and and I think that the answer is indeed that good scholarship will uncover what it, the other factors in the in the in the successful transmission of Judaism over the centuries that are independent or not only intellectual. Uh, focus. 
About two weeks ago, I was operated on, and I was so pleased to find out that my surgeon was to be an American of Chinese descent, uh, because as everybody knows, the China, all Chinese are very smart and very successful, <laughs> and he, he certainly did a good job on me. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese people is a very ancient people, as are the Jewish people, but in the modern world, they had to break out of their ancient culture and civilization in order to adopt Western modes, as did the Jewish people have to break out of an ancient culture and civilization and adopt Western modes, as we see even today in military conflict in Gaza, just in order to survive. Has anyone made that comparison between the two peoples? Yes. You know, the main topic in my mind is Joseph Levinson. He published a very uh, modern office, you know, the Confucianism and its modern fate. What, what, the, what is the author's name? Uh, Joseph Levinson. Joseph, Joseph Levinson. The, the book is, you know, Confucianism and its modern fate. You know, he, you know, he, he's a great Jewish sinologist. He addresses the same questions. He, you know, the, 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 the Chinese engagement with the modernity. <coughs> he died very early. You know, given time, I think he probably. I was told by a scholar that he would return to uh, Judaism, you know, to, to re-examine you know, the Jewish, you know, experience uh, and to compare the two experiences. Okay, just a few young gentlemen. Thank you so much for the lecture. The, the possibilities that you open up um, in the study of Judaism seem to me unique and are incredibly exciting where Judaism is studied on its own terms, um, seemingly in the first time in history from, from the Chinese perspective. Um, I was wondering how, as a scholar, um, you saw Chinese study, uh, Jewish studies in China balancing, taking the best of Western culture study of Judaism, um, but also taking advantage of that unique perspective without the bias, without the burdens, um, how do you, and at the same time, how do you not Chinese as a pie and say that Judaism? Um, how do you kind of walk that tightrope between taking the best of Western study of Judaism, but not locking into its biases? The people, you know, honestly, we do research from our own agenda, from our own questions. So, I think, I'm, I, can, I can't say, you know, for, for scholars, you know, for other scholars, from my perspective, I think I'm interested in, you know, uh, how Judaism, you know, face, you know, modernity, you know. I think there are a lot of parallels between, you know, our Chinese tradition, you know, how to fit our own tradition. To, without those burdens, you know, that's 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 a kind of blessing, you know. We don't need to, you know, uh, reflect those anti-Semitic, you know, in court. Probably give us, a, you know, uh, a more advantageous, you know, point to to, to keep a you know detached and objective view on this on these issues. It's a difficult question. <laughs> Thank you for uh, what was a really beautifully craft, crafted lecture, um, really a model of clarity of thought. Thank you. Um, my question really gets to the heart of the distinction you drew between Jewish studies, uh, say, in the United States and Jewish studies in China. And I might pick it up at the end of your remarks when you um, asked a question about the Janus-based quality of Jewish studies in China as well. The inward appeal to one's colleagues and the outward appeal to a broader audience, which of course has the effect of collapsing the very distinction that you seem to draw between Jewish studies in China and Jewish studies abroad. And so I'm curious to know 
whether or not the exceptionalism, which is a part of Jewish studies in the Israeli and American context, that is to say the sense not only that this is an enterprise that should serve a communal good, but there is something truly exceptional in the Jewish historical experience. But I'm curious to know if that isn't, or in fact might well be present, because when I read Shushin's quote about Yavne, it seems to be a re-articulation of a certain kind of an exceptionalist posture. And I wonder, therefore, if one really vanquishes it altogether. And then, it's really, you mentioned um, the reaction of, of, uh, of the Saudi ambassador. I wonder if your colleagues who study Christianity and Islam um, have uh, similar questions about um, exceptionalizing their subject matters relative to the study of those subjects elsewhere. Um, in other words, is there something about um, cultures, religions, peoples of long-standing duration that present models of comparison with the Chinese that um, incline its students in China to render the subjects exceptional? <laughs> exceptional, what did I know? It's exceptional. Because the end of your comment really sort of had the effect of bringing us back into the very, the very channel that defined the virus outside of the first time it's okay. Yeah, but, but, but it's in a kind of a reverse direction. Chinese scholars. Okay. 
problem, the, the, the challenge is to, to provide a, you know, accurate and objective, you know, source of information for the Chinese reading public. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I remember the sequence. Oh, yeah. I always take second stage and my wife dying. I'll get this mic back. Oh. <laughs> um, my husband and I are very close friends of Xu Xin. Yeah, a very close friend to our institute. <laughs> right. Uh, his name is Guilford Glazer, and I'm Diane. And here's my question. It's about Xu Xin. Um, we remember when the temple was destroyed, and the Jews were taken off as slaves to Babylon. And then Cyrus the Great came against the walls of Babylon and said, short version, you guys, you join me, we won't bother you. You fight me, you're dead. And the Babylonians said, we're, we're, we'll accept you, we'll accept you. And then Cyrus the Great said, any Jewish people that want to go back to Jerusalem can, and they can stay here, they can do their own thing. That's where I start my story. And a lot of the Jews in my my reading, uh, were businessmen, and instead of going back to Jerusalem, they went along the Silk Route, and they went through Persia, which is now another, has another name, and then a lot of them ended up in China. And they were never, they were injured by fire, flood, disaster, but never by the Chinese people. And I, they intermarried with Chinese. And they look Chinese, the Jewish people do. And I've often wondered whether Xu Xin thinks he has Jewish blood. <laughs> you ask him this question? <laughs> I, I, he's going to be here next year, and I'm going to ask him that, but I thought you might know the answer. <laughs> Okay. Answering that question. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask him. And here's my husband. He has a question. I don't know what it is, though. <laughs> my question is really a statement. Uh, I come from a little town in Tennessee. And that's, a secure, that's more curious than Chinese Jews. <laughs> 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 and uh, my wife had a television program, somebody remember, Jewish Television Network. And she interviewed Chu Xin a long time ago. We kind of got interested in this subject. And uh, all these things that have been posed today, we wonder why. Chinese are getting to be pretty good friends with the Jewish people in Israel. And uh, I, I deal with that a little bit. No, I'm not paid to, but I do it. And um, the Chinese have been remarkably friendly on a State Department level. And I don't know who you fellows are, but if you're, if you're real Chinese, you're our friends now. <laughs> <laughs> so when Diane had this television program, and somebody introduced her to shoot shit. And she said, shall I do it? I said, sure, be interesting. In my little town, I could never remember it. My father and a Greek and an Italian and Chinese all played play off golf on Saturday night. It was his night out. And around Pot Valley Soap. And uh, the Chinese man spoke poor English. But he knew how to run a good bookstore, a good bookstore. And my dad would laugh and say, these people are here thinking Chinese because it's staggering with the English are not making the smartest people, but they're the smartest people in town. So we kind of, we, this Chinese man used to come to our house and the kids would uh, pursue him. I don't know if this story matters much. <laughs> Yeah, Diane is, Diane is an advocate of Xu Xin, and we decided to uh, put an university in Nanking, and, 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 
and, and help that university get started, provided they had some good Jewish, Jewish departments. And they, you see, spread it out now. He's been pretty good about you, of course. And I uh, hope he doesn't have to retire soon. I thought you might be interested in how we just, one thing we discovered, Xu Xin. Xu Xin came here and he made a tour of uh, America. Came back and he said, I have spent holidays with Jewish people. I'm so excited. And uh, I said, how did you do that? He said, well, I said, I studied up on young Rosh Hashanah and young Kippur. And we talked about that, the holidays. And then we had the holidays. Passover, whatever I knows about Passover. He said, where he really got me, I couldn't believe it. He said, also, I spent some time with the family on Simcha's Torah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a time when run around talking about Simcha's Torah, but we already know what it is ourselves. <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful to see this group here interested in this subject. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, have uh, been pretty good through the wrong political level, national level. They joke with me, some of your top leaders, and said, why are you so interested in the Jewish people? He said, well, they're smart. If they were dumb, we wouldn't be interested in them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, they're really smart. And uh, it's deepened and deepened. Uh, at University of Nantes, the, the program has expanded. And, it, yes. and we've, had, we've had a conference of Jewish people, state of Israel, working in China, so vast. You have to be a shadow on the ground. And John Fisher, where are you, John? Where are you at, John? Is the head of, uh, of our foundation. Oh, he's practically Chinese. He took my granddaughter with him when he went to uh, China last month. And it's a remarkable success. People are really interested in the subject. And there's a secret that was told to me. Right, believing about why the Chinese, the Chinese are thinking about it. They like smart people. That's who they want to attach to. That's good common sense. Done if you don't do it. And um, they have gotten really together. It's a remarkable thing. I don't know whether it has ramifications for State Department things or, or the diplomatic relations or what it is, but it's going together on a big scale. And John has organized five or six organizations five or six organizations that are doing this to American Jewish organizations that have all gotten together to be more powerful on a, on a level of politics and, and any other level there is. And so I want to congratulate you fellows and the group for all getting together because you're on a winning track. wouldn't mind going back, but I was curious to the very first slide that you presented with the magazines or book covers. I was wondering if you could translate some of those uh, book covers. How to make yourself uh, rich quickly. <laughs> <laughs>
because of the, the Bible for uh, Jewish, you know, uh, successful wells, you know, for thousands of years. Okay, I'll question all the way to the back. Here, okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much for the interesting talk. I was in China in an academic environment in 1982, so the situation has changed a lot, and I have plenty of anecdotes I'm not going to bore anyone with on attitudes also towards Zionism and toward uh, just the academic environment when I was there, which was very interesting. And I have a question, though. Uh, really, just one bigger one or one very short one. The big, one, bigger one is: Are Chinese scholars of Jewish studies using? They have a, a unique perspective to go into questions that we really can't go into in the West. Questions like the image of the Jew in Taiping Tianguo, or how the residual from that era, because Jews figure strongly in that. So, how does that influence already from 1860 to the present, and what is still there or isn't there? And the other question was in Xu Xin's book, when he's talking about intellectuals, you're saying it has a cultural revolution backdrop. Is he referring to them as Jersher Fanze, or how is he referring to them? As, like Jersher Fanze, how is he referring to intellectuals in the original? Jersher Fanze. Yeah, is that how he's calling intellectuals, or is he using another term? So, okay, so not in your way, So, never mind. So, so he's using the term, that is my question. So the first one was about just typing Tianguo or other kinds of questions that Chinese would have more access than a Western Jewish scholar would. The first question is pretty tricky. You know, in, I think in ancient China, you know, ancient Chinese were very ethnocentric. They have no interest in distinguishing you know, uh, who is foreigners. They lump them together as you know, uh, people with colored eyes. Or, uh, or, or barbarians, man, Rong Di, or, or barbarians. So. No, for example, in, in ancient historical, Chinese historical evidence or sources, you know, Muslims uh, and uh, Jews were lumped together. There's no separate category for them. For example, uh, Jews in ancient Kaifeng were called the Muslims with blue caps. But I think Tango is not so old. I think Tango is 19th century. Yeah, but the people are not, you know, the, the, the term was coined by Christian missionaries. Only among, you know, Christian missionaries, they can differentiate, or among the intellectuals, they can di differentiate who is Jew, who is Christian, you know. For the most Chinese, they don't distinguish any, you know, they call them, you know, or even today, they call them Okay, so the question right here in the first row, and then we'll um, in your uh, interesting analysis of Xu Xin's passage here, you refer to his background in the Cultural Revolution. That's my speculation. <laughs> well, it sounds plausible. But the point is, this would indicate to me that there's no such a thing as a value-free attitude towards history. It would also suggest to me that the second part of what Michael Myers was talking about pure scholarship doesn't exist. I probably will return to your question in my next talk. You know, <laughs> especially in, I can give you a, according to modern, the postmodernism or postcolonialism. You know, some scholars even argue. You know, the Kaifen community is a pure invention by the Christian missionaries. I don't buy this. I will, you know, so I will show, you know, I will talk that a little bit more in my next talk. You know, there are historical truths. For example, there are, you know, uh, inscriptions. There are artifacts left over by the community. And the, the argument, you know, you know, that support the pure invention by Christian missionaries 
completely, it's based, based, it was completely based on Christian missionaries, not on those artifacts. So, I think it's, 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 it's argument from silence. It's totally untenable. And there are historical truths. That's, that's probably my a little bit naive, but I think there are historical visions of rights that have values. Yes. Yeah, we are, I think that's, that's true, you know, we all have our own agenda, our own bias, our own perception. But we, if we are aware of this, you know, bias, more aware of this bias, more, I think, more, a more terrible, you know, conclusion we may, we may make. So, a question back here. I wonder if I could insert a footnote before I give the mic to you. That is, since this issue has been popped up twice or three times about Xu Xin's comments um, through that particular historical um, event that the Jewish intellectuals began to take a central role, that comment, in my understanding, in addition to this immediate backdrop of the Cultural Revolution, has a long root in the Confucian tradition, especially the literary scholars. According to Confucianism, the ideal model of ruling is the literary scholars provide all these advices while well, the emperor only has this noble blood and has the mandate to rule but the actual wisdom the strategy which all these specific advices come from the so-called intellectuals that i think is still wandering around in the back mind of all even contemporary chinese intellectuals that's my reading um. My wife and I have been very fortunate to make a number of trips to Europe, to uh, China, where we have gotten off the beaten path, off of where the tourists have run, and ridden trains, and ridden the buses, and such. And when you have discussions with the average people there, it's not only the money idea that they are so intrigued about Jews, it's the culture, it is the willing to sacrifice to sacrifice us today so our kids can have a better life than we do. Much like the American Jew had in the 50s, uh, get a view of them that they'll do anything in order to sacrifice so their kids can have a better life. I understand now with the prosperity that's over there, today is also very important, but it used to be that it was the next generation will do very well. And in a number of places, in a number of the smallest villages, we would always have many Chinese say, oh, we are the lost tribe. Uh, as many other countries have said, we've had people walk up to us on three or four occasions and said, "You may not know this, but we are we are the twelve tribe." And uh, they just and I think it's not a religious significance at all. It's just a value system that they realize that they share with the Jewish people, and they're not really that interested in the religious significance of it. It's just in the struggle that they've gone through. Um, and how adapted we have been through history of being able to survive and now being able to prosper. It's my first time to hear you know, people con you know, re conceive they are in a lost tribe, or one of them in lost tribes. We've had it on at least four occasions in four wildly different places. Okay. Oh, we also had that in Fiji and in another place. <laughs> There's a question back here, the mic back here, and then over there in the back here. I'm a teacher of young children, and just as you are experiencing interest in another group that you are researching about, the young children enjoy finding out about how other people in other countries live and understanding the culture. So even here in the lab school when I was teaching there, we did many studies and one was of uh, the Chinese people and we do the Japanese people and we did the early Californian people and the Native American people. And the children loved that. And my question to you is, is there anything like that happening in China so that the children can understand about America or other countries? Yes. yes. Are, um, young children? Yeah. A lot of you know, young, young children are interested in America. Do they learn it in school? I don't teach it in school. 
<laughs> they, they do, yeah, they do. They have a lot of sources of information from the internet, you know, from you know, news coverage, from books. Well, since yeah. I'm an anthropologist working on contemporary issues, I might have better information. Flow that is. I mean, diversity is increasingly a new issue in contemporary Chinese society. Therefore, more and more people turn their attention to this. How long it takes to trickle down to the formal education system? That's another question. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that there is a parallel movement going on in South America. Uh, in Bogota, Colombia, in Recife, in Brazil, the rabbis cannot possibly cope with so many converts that uh, flock to the Jewish synagogues. And I think probably the Holocaust romanticized the fate of the Jews, the Jews that were not defeated, and the, they're coming back again. So. The, Chinese interest in Judaism is duplicated by Brazil, by, uh, by Italy recently, where a uh, lot of people have come up wanting to be Jewish that were converted during the Inquisition times. So it's a strange phenomenon that I personally love and revere. So, so probably that corroborates, that corroborates uh, you know, a Jewish saying that Jews are the light in the among the Gentiles. <laughs> I have to be the bad guy. <laughs> Let's do the last question. Sorry, after this, we have to end this talk. Um, can you comment about uh, the Shanghai Jews, their presence in China in the 30s and 40s, and did that have any influence on uh, future scholarship about about Jews and what about the archive? I think it's at your university. Um, the resources in that archive. Can you talk a little bit about what they are and how they're being used? Okay, the archives. The archives now mainly in uh, Shanghai Municipal Archives. But I think you know uh, uh, there are or other you know, important archives. One in Jerusalem, in the National Museum of uh, Israel, in Hebrew <coughs> University. That's in Yiddish. Very important. You know, as far as I know, a PhD candidate at Hebrew U is writing a paper on Yiddish presses of Shanghai. So he made, she made a lot of use of archives in Israel, the National Museum, uh, the National Library of Hebrew U. The other is in uh, the Leo Bike Institute at New York, in the Center for Jewish History. They have a quite sizable collection of you know uh, of the of the documents left over by the uh, Shanghai uh, refugee uh, refugees. Yeah. And other archives in in Shanghai, I don't encourage you to go to the municipal you know archiving Shanghai, they are not open to, you know, they are not very effective you know, in locating all those documents. Because I have several friends, and they are very, they had, you know, they had very frustrated experience in you know, dealing with the, you know, the, ar the municipal archives of Shanghai. Yeah, very frustrated experience. Somehow, well, last month, I accompanied the Chancellor Block and the VP Cindy Fan went to that museum in October in Shanghai. We visited the museum, Museum of Jewish Refugees, and also uh, somebody showed us in the Hong Kong neighborhood, the point that led us to several uh, narrow lanes of it, and even talked with somebody there. It's quite a nice experience. So what I really want to be glad to say is, next year, the exhibition coming this way will come to you today. And, uh, yes, and we're going to sponsor and then try to make a huge event out of that.
So I should say, on behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, I'm the director, and I'm very happy to be able to partner with the Confucius Institute and to, to bring this exhibition here. It'll be at Hillel in October of uh, 2012, so about a year from now, and it'll be on the 13th, sorry, 2013, about a year from now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there will be a symposium with it and a major cultural um, event. So stay tuned for that. You. Well, is that, I mean, no, that would be nice to be a dance the end of this wonderful talk. Thank you.